Good morning, everybody. It's a nice Sunday morning, and uh, this week we're going to be focusing on the Turks and the Mongols and other nomadic tribes as we venture through world history. Uh, I hope during the past week you've had a good week and that um, you've been properly socially distancing the best you can, washing your hands, and continuing to take care of yourselves and your family. For some of you guys, I know it's been tough to uh, be at home uh, and working online, and especially when you do usually better face-to-face, -face. Um, and I feel you. Uh, we're almost getting to the end here. We're, we've got about three weeks left, so hold tight. You can do this. You know, we'll, we'll make this happen, and if you need me, of course, email me. Now, let's talk about the nomadic tribes and uh, focusing primarily in these chapters on the Turks, the Mongols, um, and as we, you know, look at these migratory patterns of uh, nomadic peoples, tribal peoples from East Asia over into, uh, they, as they move west, into Europe, um, into the Middle East, into China. So, um, the first thing I want to say about nomadic tribal people is that their characteristics are all basically uh, the same or quite similar, quite similar. So they're clan-based, uh, they're territorial. Um, most are nomadic horsemen. They are herds, pastoral nomads. They herd sheep and cattle, goats. Um, they trade for grains and berries and things like that. Um, some live in houses. Others, like the Mongols, live in yurts. Y-U-R-T-S, yurts. And uh, many uh, homes even now uh, that are in the shape of a circle, Dell Tech is a company that makes homes and they're certain, they look like a yurt. And um, with the tiny house movement, some of you guys might be aware of, uh, yurts have come back into fashion. But uh, these yurts were not simple. I mean, um, you know, sometimes we think that if you don't have a brick and mortar home or uh, a home made of, you know, um, you know, uh, as I call it, sticks and bricks, you know, wood framed home, that in some way it's much more simple to in a tent or a yurt or something like that. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, these places were pretty amazing. In these tribal groups, in these nomadic tribal groups, uh, up until we get the concepts of private ownership of property, uh, re re keep in mind that gender roles are going to be very, very similar. So there's going to be gender roles for each group. Women are going to take care of the household. They're going to milk the sheep or the cows and uh, take care of um, the every day-to-day -day kind of business of the herd. But men are going to be hunting. Men are going to be putting, creating the framework for yurts and the tents and the homes. I mean, they are equally working. There's not one group that, that works harder than the other. And in many ways, uh, they're, um, while some groups are patrilineal, they, uh, there's a lot of still gender power equ equality. Okay, it's, it's not the same type of uh, patrilineal or patriarchal um, relationships as you find um, where people uh, own private property, as we talked about at the beginning of the semester. Now, most of these folks, they're traveling on horseback, um, specifically the Mongols. So let's talk about them first. Well, the Mongols and the Turks and the Huns come from uh, Eastern uh, Asia or from Asia, okay, the Asian steppes. So uh, a lot of times they're fighting, they're on the western edge of what we call modern-day China right now. And uh, 
they have a combination. Sometimes they're just strictly pastoral nomads, and sometimes you have like a hybrid kind of relationship between the urban centers as well as pastoral nomads. Each group is a little different. They are all courage cultures. They're all courage cultures, which means you have to prove yourself valuable um, not only to your family and your clan and your tribe, but you know you you're going to ha there's um, you know you have to show your your worth and courage is not just doing stuff it, without fear. It's being able to rise above the fear. That's really the the big deal here. That's important. Um, life in the Middle Ages and even now as we sit here you know, homebound, um, there's a lot of challenges and um, we have to show courage even through our fear. We have to keep moving forward. And that's what a lot of these, um, or most of these uh, tribal people are. They're, they are courage cultures. So this is important uh, to keep in mind. Now, um, like I say, women's roles are usually pretty equal, but because of death of women uh, due to uh, childbirth and, um, you know, women are a commodity in these groups. And that's an important thing to remember. As a matter of fact, I think your primary document quiz has to do with that. Last week it was on foot binding. This week it's on abduction of women, I believe. And I, I think it's important to recognize um, how important women are and women were. And, and we still, I mean, look, we have sex trafficking. There is, women are a commodity. We've talked about that before, back when we were face-to-face -face in class. So here's another perspective of that, another example of that. Um, so these nomadic tribal people, um, uh, the Huns came kind of early. They were part, they, they, uh, pretty much, um, Attila, uh, pretty much, um, held the Roman empire at bay and, um, extorted the Romans. Uh, the Romans were afraid of them and they, he extorted them. Um, and, but as we go a little, the, the, the Huns are pretty early, but when we're looking at the Turks and we're looking at the Mongols, we're looking around the 12th century, 11th, 12th century um, Asia. By the time we get into 1270s at uh, Kublai Khan, which is Chinggis's uh, uh, grandson, is really uh, ruling China under the Mongol Empire, which is also called the Yuan. Yu Y-U-A-N empire. I mentioned that last week. Um, so anyway, though, um, so, so these groups of people, they, um, they are lived together in tribal units, in clans, um, in, in one yurt or one tent, one house, uh, maybe several families of a particular clan the head uh, males and females of the clan, you know, uh, rule over everyone else who is uh, younger. Um, and then as your textbook says, uh, properly, you know, eventually, eventually, or many times, uh, a particular person will rise up. They're very charismatic and folks follow them. And that's what we have here with Kubla, um, not Kubla, but Chinggis Khan, the grandfather of Kubla, the first Khan of Khans, the King of Kings, and um, and he takes his uh, his people, the Mongols, and he rides uh, Mongol horses, which are smaller type of horse, very sturdy, um, and he rides them west, and he starts seizing um, towns and villages, settlements. Um, initially for, uh, for what they have, uh, grains and, and things that were hard to come by. But he is, he and the Mongols themselves are far more superior warriors than the people they find that they, um, conquer. And, um, and, and that's because Mongol warriors and Mongols, the people, both boys and girls, 
uh, children from a very early age learn how to ride horses and um, learn how to defend themselves. And, and they live their life doing that. I mean, they, they live their life uh, learning how to uh, be uh, warriors and uh, defenders of uh, the tribe. So um, it's even been said that um, Mongol warriors would, uh, they could ride and, and sleep on their horse. They could just, they could literally sit on the horse for, for 24 hours. And um, uh, if they get thirsty and there's no water around, they would nick a little vein in the horse's neck and drink their blood for nourishment. So we're pretty, we're talking some pretty heady folks here. And the Mongol hordes, a large group of people uh, who were Mongol warriors as they went west, uh, uh, Chinggis Khan was known for his uh, ruthlessness and uh, brutality. And, and he was. And the first groups of towns and settlements that he went to, um, he would destroy them. Just flat out destroy them. And, um, and, but if, as he got further west, you know, word got to western settlements and towns, the Mongols were coming, and those groups, that settlements that, that just surrendered from the get-go, lived. And uh, some of the men were forced to then become part of the uh, Mongol uh, army. So... Uh, you know, as they continued uh, conquests and invasions, uh, westward invasions. Well, um, uh, some of these places that were um, invaded by the Mongols that we still have right now, the city or uh, Moscow, Moscow in Russia was uh, an original place of uh, Mongols and then eventually with the Vikings as well. Uh, they, those were two groups that became settlements uh, that settled together um, around Moscow and around the Kiev, the, um, down the Volga River in Ukraine. Now, um, uh, uh, so women were expected to be warriors as well. Like I said, children were, were taught to be warriors from a young age. Um, the uh, Mongols kind of between Chinggis and Kublai, they ended up going back into Upper Mongolia and eventually came down under Kublai Khan into China and took over northern China. Uh, southern China, which was remained the Song Dynasty, there were they for a while they were able to um, uh, still remain the Song Dynasty still remained for a little while while the Mongols um, eventually came together under Kublai Khan and, and took it over. An interesting thing about Kublai Khan, um, I think I mentioned last week, under that Mongol dynasty, he became more Chinese. But one of the things that the Mongols did, and uh, even the Turks later on, is that they their brutality... Um, created an um, an environment where uh, people who were traders uh, were not um, robbed uh, because of the fear of retribution and punishment from um, if you were under Mongol if you were if your trade route was on Mongol land then um, you. Uh, the Mongols really did uh, protect that trade route and death was, you know, brutal death was the punishment. So uh, like even Marco Polo recognized that um, if you were under a Kublai Khan land or under Mongol and Turk rule, you were less likely to be robbed with, from your goods um, that was a very big deal, and that was one of the reasons why Kubla and some of these um, groups, uh, nomadic groups that ended up being sedentary like the Turks, uh, were able to be successful because um, as brutal as they were, 
they allowed for prosperity of trade. And that's a really big key thing. If you remember from the Roman Empire, why did the empire grow so well? Well, because if you were part of the Roman Empire, you were part of secure trade. And your trade, um, your products could go far and wide securely. So that's a pretty big deal because it meant that who, whoever you were selling your goods to, um, they would get there. And that meant that you were going to get money and therefore, by default, your, your, uh, um, you were going to get, um, um, I want to say wealthy, but your, um, um, what is the right word? Uh, not cost living, but your, the way you lived was going to get better. Suddenly I'm having, oh, you know, can't think. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, so, so at the end of the day, trade is a huge dealio when it comes to um, success of any group of people and any, um, uh, no matter where you are in, in uh, history, trade and, and successful trade is an impetus. It's a, it's a means by which uh, any group can grow and prosper. So the Turks... The Turks are really interesting as well because um, they are also a tribal group. They're more of a hybrid, I guess you say, between the urban and, and nomadic uh, groups. They eventually are able to take over the Silk Road and, um, and they move west too. Now, the Turks end up becoming um, uh, converted to Islam. And, um, and many of these nomadic tribes that are in the, the Turks and um, various groups that are similar to the Turks, um, even now the Mongols do not convert to Islam, but uh, Chinggis and Kublai Khan always, they liked uh, like diversity. They were, they had people who were Jewish, they had people who were um, a Muslim, they had people who were Christian in their courts. I mean, this was, you know, this is, they were, they were very open uh, to diversity, to education, to technology, um, just because they were super brutal. Um, and, and I'm not dismissing that, but, um, from a historical perspective, you can't, just um, say a group is like this. They're brutal, therefore they must be simpletons or they must be brutes or they, they have no other redeeming value. And that's not necessarily true. We can't put ourselves in that time period uh, to know what the hardships were, to know why brutality works so well. Um, uh, I don't, I'm certainly not an advocate for it, but I can't say that the Mongols or the Turks were all bad. They, there were bad principles. There were bad things they did, but um, they also did some very interesting things as well that could be looked at as positive. And one of those things was diversity. Um, and the Turks eventually, many of the Turks eventually converted to Islam and, um, and through that conversion, um, many tribes that were not related to one another, who were nomadic pastoral nomads, um, ended up coming together under the banner of Islam. And it's the Seljuk Turks that end up, which is a subgroup of the Turks, um, that end up creating eventually the Ottoman Empire, or what becomes the Ottoman Empire, and what eventually becomes the country of Turkey. So, um, the, the, uh, as you'll read you'll, this, um, this week, you, you learn about who some of these folks were and some of their characteristics. But eventually they, they do come under the banner of Islam, uh, certainly the Turks do, and uh, eventually create um, the Ottoman Empire, which stays around until 1918 at the end of World War I, which is a big deal. Now, um, there are other nomadic groups who you uh, read about now. Um, 
I don't think our textbook goes into the Vikings very much, but the Vikings are, they're not so nomadic. They're Norse people, but uh, they are looking for spoils. They're going a Viking. They're Danes, actually, and they're to, to go a Viking was to go out and look for, um, uh, they did just what the Mongols did. They went on, but they went by boat and they they uh would um invade they didn't actually conquer they would just invade settlements and they would be very brutal and they would take away grains and goods that's what to go a viking was to bring back spoils of of war if you will although it was a one-sided war most of these people uh had nothing um and the men would go and they would rape women which is like you know, it's a control thing. Rape is control. It's not sexual. It's control. And, um, and there's, uh, there's a saying that's, that's, uh, don't cut off your nose in spite of your face. Uh, don't cut off your nose in spite of your face. And that's an interesting saying. You guys might not have heard it right now, but that was being in use even in my time. And that came from um, a real event that happened when uh, Vikings were heard to be coming down um, a river to a settlement where there was a convent, a group of nuns. And when they heard the Vikings were coming, they did. They cut off, many cut off their own noses so that the Vikings would not rape them. Yeah. I mean, boy, this is, you know, some of them got raped anyway because it wasn't about what they looked like. Anyway, though, so the Vi many of the Vikings eventually settled down, and in those settlements is where we find, um, like, the city of Kiev or Kiev uh, in Ukraine, and also in Scotland and in England, a lot of Danes... Uh, uh, settled there as well. And we're looking at the Middle Ages there, but, um, and it's also uh, understood that um, Eric the Red um, came down um, through, he was a Dane, and he actually is one of the first people to ever, he and his group of people were one of the first groups to ever land in North America, who were not Native American, who came west through Beringia, and they were in Nova Scotia, uh, and there's from 800 BC, or no, 800 AD, I'm sorry, 800 AD, there are settlements, there are Dane Viking settlements in uh, Nova Scotia, um, but then they left. Um, there's also groups called the Goths, the Visigoths, uh, Goth, the Ostrogoths, the Lombards, the Bourbons, the Anglos, the Saxons, the Celts, the Picts. There's a whole group of nomadic uh, tribesmen who, um, who uh, we don't totally have time to study about, but they came from um, either the north the lands of the Netherlands and um, Sweden, uh, where the Danes were from, or from um, Asia, the Asian steppes, which is west of Mongolia, the Mongolian desert, from the Caucasus Mountains, Indo-Europeans who, who were, they were tribal in nature, courage cultures, and they came uh, west and ended up settling in uh, Europe. The Visigoths, I believe it was the Visigoths or the Ostrogoths ended up settling in Spain, what is modern day Spain. So, you know, we're going into this time period where we see this, these waves of tribal people coming into what becomes Europe and settling down and, um, and mingling with local population. And those groups become what or really become Europeans. Um, the Anglos, the Saxons are fighting with Danes and the Normans, the Normans are French. Anglos and Saxons come from around Germany and Celt 
And so, you know, we hear about those folks a lot more because we learn more about English and French history overall. But, um, you know, these are really tribal people and they, they end up settling in what becomes Europe. Um, and um, as we go forward, uh, one of the things I want you to be thinking about, just thinking about, is um, when it comes to our chapter this week, the Mongols and the Turks, as we focus on the Turks and we focus on Islam, the Turks uh, becoming converted to Islam, um, next week we're going to be talking about Christianity and the growth of Christianity in um, Western Europe or in Europe in general. And, and we're going to start to see the beginning of rivalry, the, the, even that leads into the modern day, the rivalry between the, the people who are Muslim and Christianity. And um, so that's where I want your head to be um, going forward through this week. I want you to think about who these Turks are, the Mongols, um, movement of Islam, the conversion of Islam, and then I, because it's going to set up for next week, okay, next week's discussion board. All right, I think that's about it for the moment. Um, I hope you are enjoying some of these little mini lectures. I hope you're watching them. Um, your discussion board is coming directly from, uh, or our readings and from this mini lecture. And I want you to uh, please keep working at it. Don't forget that after you make your initial post, you need to post to three other classmates, please, for a total of four uh, posts. We're, we are three weeks away from the end of the semester, guys. Come on. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. Yeah! You can do this. You can do this. So um, stay with it. Email me. My email might be full for the first couple of days. Do not worry. I am on top of that. And uh, I promise um, I am I, I'm available. Some way or another, I'll be available. And I'm working to make sure that I'm available to you. I love you. Mwah. Mean it. And um, I'll talk to you next week. Okay. Bye.